So let me begin with Newman, about whom I know a good deal more than uh, about Guardini. And let me begin like this. One way of distinguishing between different personalisms or between different strands within personalism is to look at the particular evil that a personalism is opposed to. So in a well-known letter to Henri de Lubac, Karol Wojtyla, I mentioned this yesterday, said that he was writing a treatise on the human person that was meant to counteract the degradation of persons witnessed in World War II and to vindicate the dignity and mystery of persons. That was the enemy and reaction to which Wojtyla developed his personalism. With Kierkegaard, the enemy was somewhat different. It was not the degradation of the concentration camps, but the depersonalization that comes from living in the crowd and living by blind convention. Thus, it was natural for his personalism to express itself in a certain individualism. Today, personalism is often in reaction to materialism and naturalism. And as a result, it stresses the higher ideals by which persons live. We have, again, a different situation. If we look at the very interesting book, The Worldview of Personalism, by the Swedish philosopher Jan Bengtsson, he examines the personalism that arose in reaction to Hegel. He features those personalists who resisted the pantheistic tendencies in German idealism and who warned of the danger of persons being dissolved into the divine. So you see, we have to know who a given personalist is in debate with. We have to know the polemical situation of the personalist in order to understand the focus of his personalism. Now I say that by way of introducing Newman as proto-personalist to you. His personalism comes into focus mainly when we understand the rationalism or intellectualism that he was always resisting. In his writing about the knowledge of God by which the believer lives, Newman is always vindicating the heart against the excessive pretensions of formal deductive reasoning. Of course, Newman never held an irrationalist uh, position. He never held a fideist position. But he always fought for what Pope Benedict has called the full range of reason. And he refused to identify the whole of reason with the formal deductive exercise of it. Now, our task here now is to understand what is distinctly personalist about Newman's anti-rationalism. And first, we need to understand the exact sense of his anti-rationalism. So let me begin uh, telling you the motto of his major philosophical work uh, entitled The Grammar of Ascent. Uh, he uses a line from St. Ambrose as his motto, non in dialectica complaco deo salvum facere populum suum. It has not pleased God to redeem his people by means of logic. <laughs> and the book is all about the other means of religious knowledge by which God, in fact, does redeem his people. Or again, um, in the Grammar of Ascent, I quote here from my own study uh, on the personalism of Newman. He says of the famous argument of Paley, uh, where 
the world is likened to a watch, and an inference is made to God as to a watchmaker. And Newman always had a critical reserve about that argument. And he says, if I am asked to convert others by the argument of Paley, I say plainly, I do not care to overcome their reason without touching their hearts. It was an argument, he thought, that appealed too little to the heart and to the deepest religious needs of people. It therefore played no role in Newman's own um, religious uh, apologetics. But perhaps the most striking expression um, and eloquent expression of the, what I call, anti-rationalism of Newman comes from a line uh, that I chose as the motto for my book. And it's taken from Newman's Apologia Pro Vita Sua, the famous uh, autobiographical uh, work in which he explains the path of his uh, conversion. Uh, Newman writes there, I am far from denying the real force of the arguments in proof of a god. But these <clears throat> do not warm me or enlighten me. They do not take away the winter of my desolation or make the buds unfold and the leaves grow within me and my moral being rejoice. And of that quote, he says, in effect, that he is looking for a knowledge of God that is not just a matter of rational demonstration and appeals only to the intellect, but a knowledge that makes the human heart expand. Now, why was Newman so dissatisfied with demonstrative knowledge of God, while never putting into question the validity of um, such demonstrations. And the reason is this. He thought that such knowledge by itself had little power to move us to action and commitment. He thought that it left us too much in the position of a spectator. And so in the Grammar of Ascent, uh, this major philosophical work of Newman, he drew a distinction <clears throat> between what he called notional ascent and real ascent. Now, let me first explain that distinction in general, and then we'll see how he applies it to religious knowledge. I can know in a merely notional way that I will one day die. I can know it in an abstract way like this. All living beings die. And since I, too, belong to the immense class of living beings, I, too, will one day die. But I can also know about my impending death in a way that, as Newman says, pierces me. I may feel in my bones how my death is approaching. And then I give a real assent to it, the universal mortality of all living things, of the notional ascent, now gives way to something very concrete, my personal death. Whereas I may just yawn while acknowledging my death in a notional way, I now shudder while acknowledging my death in a real way. Whereas I am a spectator of my own death, as long as my ascent is just notional, I become a participant in it as soon as my ascent becomes real. So you get the idea of the distinction. Notional ascent is abstract. It is more intellectual than imaginative. I keep a distance to the truth ascended to notionally with the result that this truth does not move me effectively or move me 
to live by the truth? By contrast, real ascent is concrete. It has an experiential immediacy, sometimes even an existential urgency. And the truth ascended to really can move me strongly, even to the point of empowering me to live by it. Um, you can get a sense of the personalist significance of real ascent from these often quoted words of Newman, which I myself also quote, not though in the packet of uh, readings. He uh, says in a famous polemical writing of his, the heart is commonly reached, not through the reason, but through the imagination, by means of direct impressions, by the testimony of facts and events, persons influence us, voices melt us, looks subdue us, deeds inflame us. In fact, the quote goes on. I don't have it here. Many a man will live and die upon a dogma. No one will die for a conclusion. Uh, which Newman says will only be notional. Now, this <clears throat> distinction between notional and real uh, can be drawn with respect to our knowledge of God. And that's where the distinction most of all interests uh, Newman. Because my assent to the existence of God can be notional or real. Let me show you Newman's own words contrasting the two uh, religious ascents. So he says, the statement that there is a God when really apprehended is the object of a strong energetic adhesion which works a revolution in the mind. But when held merely as a notion, it requires but a cold and in, ineffective acceptance. Such, is it, such in its character is the ascent of thousands whose imaginations are not at all kindled, nor their hearts inflamed, nor their conduct affected by the most august of all conceivable truths. Now, Newman is speaking there of the notional ascent of conventional believers, but he also, um, when he speaks of the knowledge proper to theology, uh, uh, Newman thinks that theologians primarily live and move in the realm of notional ascent. Uh, and so I, you have this, any, always an excuse for quoting Newman in his own words because he is such an inspired writer. Uh, so he, uh, in one place, speaks of uh, some of the names of God as elaborated in uh, philosophical theology. Uh, God as one who is, he says, self-existing, absolutely infinite, who has ever been and ever will be, to whom Nothing is past or future, who has all perfections and the fullness and archetype of every possible excellence, the truth itself, wisdom, love, justice, holiness, one who is all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, incomprehensible. And uh, Newman acknowledging the undeniable and indispensable truth of those names of God. Uh, nevertheless painfully feels something missing. Uh, and he says, it is an ascent, that is, to these names of God, following upon acts of inference and other purely intellectual exercises. And it is an ascent to a large development of predicates correlative to each other, or at least intimately connected together. And watch this expression of Newman, drawn out as if on paper, as we might map a country we had never seen. So uh, Newman uh, uh, 
acknowledging the truth of this notional ascent and indispensability of it, still longs for something more, precisely the real ascent. And he expresses his longing like this. So far is clear. But the question follows, can I attain to any more vivid ascent to the being of a god than that which is given merely to the notions of the intellect? Can I enter with a personal knowledge into the circle of truths which makes up that great thought? Can I rise to what I have called an imaginative apprehension of God? Can I believe as if I saw? So Newman uh, somehow is aspiring for that uh, deeper knowledge that he had expressed earlier when he spoke of the knowledge that makes the buds unflow unfold and the leaves grow within me and my moral being rejoice. So uh, Newman thinks that he not only has this aspiration for this more concrete, real apprehension of God, but that it is, in fact, possible. He thinks that we possess, in his language, very expressive, not only the theological intellect, as exemplified in those names of God, but also we possess a religious imagination. So that distinction between the theological intellect and the religious imagination is quite fundamental to Newman. And while the former, the theological intellect, specializes in notional ascent, the latter is capable of real ascent, which may be surprising when you consider that God is a hidden God. So how should we have some apprehension of him with all that concreteness of real uh, apprehension? How should that even be possible in the case of God? Well, Newman uh, proceeds uh, in the grammar of Ascent to show that the materials, so to say, with which the religious imagination works are found, most of all, in the experience of being morally bound to act, in the sense of ought that we feel in our conscience. The religious imagination gains not just a notional, but a real apprehension of a divine lawgiver. Now notice, notice Newman is not saying that we infer from moral obligation to God as its source, such an inference, he thinks, would yield a notional apprehension of God. No, we discern in the moral obligation the divine lawgiver. That is what lets us gain a real apprehension of God, so that now the thought of him can, as he put it, work a revolution in our minds. The real apprehension of God as mediated through conscience is more like an experience of God than an inference to his existence. Now, um, the question uh, for us in the setting of this seminar is, what's distinctively personalist about this, this passion for real apprehension and real ascent in Newman. I might add that anyone who reads widely in the religious writings and in the sermons of Newman can only be astonished at Newman's power of converting what is at first for the reader a notional ascent into a real ascent. Uh, that is one way of expressing the almost preternatural power of the sermons of Newman. They evoke real ascent to uh, things of faith and lead you beyond um, what Newman takes to be the relative barrenness of a merely uh, notional ascent. But as I say, what is distinctly personalist uh, about this great theme in Newman? And 
perhaps two things are obvious. Um, the real ascent is gained in and through a personal encounter with God in conscience. And it's not just a matter of thinking about God. It is an encounter with Deus vivens et videns, the God living and seeing. It is an encounter with an I thou structure. Uh, So, so that uh, makes it a singularly personal kind of religious knowledge. And the other uh, second point is this. The real ascent of which Newman speaks is personalist in that I am alive in it with my whole being. As long as my ascent is only notional, I'm not in the ascent with my whole being. And the ascent is, in a way, one-dimensional. There's this distance that remains, uh, distance I keep to the truth notionally ascended to. It's very interesting that um, uh, this expression, with my whole being, which is very expressive for uh, the real ascent to God, is the language of Martin Buber, when he contrasts the I-thou relation with the I-it, he says, I am in the I-thou encounter with my whole being, but I can never be present with my whole being in the I-it relation. Um, and in fact, uh, Buber interestingly goes on to say that I'm really alive as person in interpersonal life only in the I-thou encounter. He distinguishes between person and ego, a much thinner thing, and says, it's just as ego that I take another as it. Uh, but when I take the other as thou, uh, I am alive as person. And so that being in the real ascent, being engaged with my whole being, uh, we could sort of appropriate something from Buber and say, I am eminently alive as person uh, in that real ascent. And so uh, for those reasons, and there are perhaps others too, um, there is something eminently personalist about this uh, anti-rationalist side of Newman. Now, I do need uh, to issue the uh, the qualification uh, that Newman never intends to play off uh, real ascent against the notional ascent. Uh, it is entirely a relation of complementarity that he aspires for. He's quite aware that there is a rationality proper to real ascent that is absolutely necessary for the Believer, you can see it like this. If you just have that sense of God that uh, resonates in a deep moment of conscience, you may wonder, well, this divine, whose authority I feel in conscience, is this one God? Could it be multiple gods? And it takes theological reflection to think through why. A plurality of gods doesn't make sense, uh, and why this can only be the god of monotheism who uh, makes himself felt in, in conscience. So um, uh, to try to uh, just drop the whole of notional ascent and have one's religion based exclusively on real ascent, that's not uh, humans. Uh, Intention. It may sound that way because um, there's often a kind of polemical edge against uh, uh, this uh, uh, this array of, uh, of of notional concepts. Uh, Newman seems to feel, like many of his contemporaries in the 19th century, that there is an abundance and a super an overabundance of 
rational understanding and that uh, deeper forms of lived experience have to be recovered. But uh, that uh, certainly never leads him to, leads him to play off uh, real against notional sense. If you want a good specimen of a thinker who does play off religious experience against the rational understanding of God, look at chapter 18 in William James's book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. There, James virtually sacrifices uh, rational reflection about God to the religious experience, which is the center of his book. Newman is not like William James in that respect, uh, and has a more balanced view and knows how to give uh, reason its due by his esteem for uh, notional assent. But he thought it was a particular mission of his, at his time and place um, in history to recover uh, the real assent, this uh, kind of knowledge that, as he says, makes the buds unfold and the leaves grow within me and my moral being rejoice. There is just one other thought in Newman, and then we'll turn to uh, Ordini, uh, that I wanted to mention. Uh, it um, also shows Newman, Newman's personalism uh, asserting itself against a certain uh, rationalism. And it has to do with uh, how persons influence each other, and especially in the deepest matters, in matters of faith. How is faith uh, transmitted? Uh, and in a very early sermon of uh, Newman's, preached when he was just 30, uh, he, um, well, the sermon is entitled, Personal Influence, the Means of Propagating the Truth. And uh, I'm going to just read a few sentences which show how little Newman expected from the crafting of arguments and the writing of books, at least as compared to the living witness of a saintly believer. And so he asks, how has revelation been upheld in the world and transmitted and he says, it has been upheld not as a system, not by books, not by arguments, not by temporal power, that is the legal establishment of religion, but by the personal influence of such holy men as have already been described, who are at once the teachers and patterns of Christian truth. And then he unpacks a little more of this unique power of the living faith of the believer, this unique power to transmit itself. Men persuade themselves with little difficulty to scoff at principles, to ridicule books, to make sport of the names of good men. But, but they cannot bear their presence. It is holiness embodied in personal form, which they cannot steadily confront and bear down, so that the silent conduct of a conscientious man secures for him from beholders a feeling different in kind from any which is created by the mere versatile and garrulous reason. End of that quote, typical human. Garrulous reason. Garrulous meaning something like chattering reason. So um, that is not, perhaps that doesn't focus precisely on that point of real ascent that I spoke of above, but it does uh, show um, uh, Newman mentioning certain highly rational ways of transmitting faith and his understanding of how it really happens uh, through this personal presence of the committed believer. All right, so much on Newman. Um, 
I have also been asked uh, uh, to say something about uh, the great Romano Guardini uh, as an eminent 20th century personalist uh, thinker. Um, many of you may not know so much about Guardini. He was born in 1885 and died in, eight, in 1968. He is one of those forgotten masters. He is in need of a legacy project that uh, would retrieve his rich uh, literary legacy. He was, first of all, a religious writer. Undoubtedly, his best known work is The Lord, uh, profound meditations on the person of Christ and different moments in the life of Christ also very well known for his book, The Spirit of the Liturgy. Uh, Pope Francis, in the encyclical on the environment, quotes extensively from Guardini's book, The End of the Modern World, uh, a book which uh, perhaps most of all contains his personalist thought is this book, The World and the Person. And from that, I have taken the extract uh, for uh, Guardini in the packet of readings. Uh, so I, um, as I say, I don't claim to have the overview of the whole corpus of, uh, of Guardini. Uh, I, I have more of that in the case of Newman, who has been a kind of lifelong companion uh, for me. So let me. Um, just whet your appetite for Guardini as personalist by picking out three deep thoughts of his that have enriched my thinking on personalism and I think typify the uh, pers personalist treasures, the forgotten personalist treasures in Guardini. So, for the first, let us return to the, what I called yesterday, the self-presence of the person. I was uh, explaining the Voitivian subjectivity in terms of self-presence. Now, in many of his writings, Guardini shows that the self-presence of a person can be stronger or weaker. It is weak. I am weakly present to myself when my conscious life is scattered, when I am easily distracted, when I am thrown off my center, when my conscious life is dissipated, when I am outside of myself rather than established within myself when my conscious life tends to be reduced to a succession of impressions. We all know from experience what it is like to live in this scattered way. We're unable to perform any significant act or make any significant decision in that uh, scatteredness. And we know what it is like to encounter other people living in that scattered condition. They don't seem to really be present to us. We reach for them as persons and cannot find them. But, as Guardini uh, shows, we can recover ourselves out of this scattered state. We can strengthen our self-presence. We can return to ourselves uh, by what Guardini calls recollecting ourselves. Now, in his many books on prayer, he has profound things to say about recollection, which doesn't just mean remembering something, but, or remembering something about myself, but somehow gathering myself back into its center. But what he writes is not just important for prayer, there's something of deeper personalist significance about this contrast between 
dissipated, unrecollected self-presence and centered, recollected self-presence. So Guardini, um, uh, with masterful concrete descriptions, shows how we can disentangle ourselves from the multitude of things in which we were lost. We can take a distance in recollecting ourselves to the things that had absorbed us and taken us over. We can renew um, our inner center and live out of it again. Now, what interests us from a personalist point of view is that in recollecting ourselves and strengthening the self-presence, we revive as persons. As scattered, we had gone under as persons, so to say. And as recollected, we come to ourselves as persons. By strengthening our self-presence, we live more fully as persons. We become more capable of determining ourselves in freedom, whereas as unrecollected, we're easily available to the manipulation of all kinds of outside stimuli. So Guardini shows us anew the connection between our subjectivity and our existing as persons, the very thing I was trying to get out of the Wojtyla article yesterday. And he also shows that being alive as person, being fully present as person is not a simple given, but it is an achievement. It can be gained or lost. It can come and go all on the same day. So I take that as one great uh, thought in Guardini, this idea of recollection uh, being stronger and weaker, uh, and me being accordingly more or less there as person. And now let me turn to Guardini's thought on the relation between persons. And in particular, on the way in which one person can influence another. This is something I think very deep and rich in Guardini. He is fascinated by the fact that the greater the influence of one person on another, the greater the reserve with, with which the influence is exercised. And he means that the greatest influence is exercised when one person stimulates another person to act on his own. Influence between persons is not a matter of one person dominating another or reducing another to an extension of the dominating person. It is a matter of empowering another to act in his own name. So real influence between persons is based for Guardini on a paradox of making another person free. He uh, develops interesting analogies. He takes the case of a lever that's used to move a heavy weight uh, and says, well, the weight moved is just passive uh, and completely uh, controlled by the lever. But then he brings in for comparison the way in which sunlight acts on a plant. And in that case, um, the sunlight stimulates the plant nature to come into its own as plant. Uh, and so there is a, a much greater independence in the thing being influenced. Uh, but in the case of persons, uh, that uh, paradox of profound influence uh, and self-activity, uh, self-activity under and through that influence, that is what um, he uh, explores uh, uh, again and again 
in, in a very deep way. It, it, it's important. I know some people, Tim Hall and others, are um, interested in a personalist philosophy of education. Several of you have mentioned that to me. And there's surely something here in Guardini for that. Um, it follows from uh, his account that real education is not so much stuffing the mind of a child with information, but stimulating the child to act in a way that is his own acting and forms character in the child. Uh, there is something, I think, here in Gordini that is akin to so, uh, Kierkegaard, I'm thinking especially of Kierkegaard's uh, lifetime love of Socrates. Um, uh, and Socrates as teacher uh, was exemplary for Kierkegaard. But I'm thinking in, in particular of the passage in Kierkegaard where uh, he says, what a blessing it was for Socrates that he was singularly ugly. He supposedly had warts all over his face and his nose was smashed in. It was apparently by aesthetic norms an ugly uh, face. And Kierkegaard says that was a blessing for him and his disciples because it kept his disciples from following him in a slavish way. They would depend too much if they just imitate Socrates. There needed to be something in Socrates that broke that temptation to imitate and threw the disciple back onto himself. And so that ugliness played a very important role for Kierkegaard in uh, Socrates as masterful teacher. But the idea is the same, uh, that this, um, this real influence mustn't take the other as an extension of the influencing person, or just as a, so that the enthusiastic disciple just turns himself into a bad copy of uh, the master. The real influence has to stir up independent personal life uh, of, of the disciple's own. And then the influence can be profound. Things can happen in the disciple. They could have never happened without the master. But it has to be an influence that empowers, not one that dominates. <coughs> Guardini applies uh, this uh, thought to God's dealing with us. Uh, there's a, a beautiful paper of his called God's Dominion and Man's Freedom. Uh, and what Guardini says falls in with um, what is written today about the hiddenness of God. Those of you working in philosophy are aware of a vast literature on the hiddenness of God. And uh, for Guardini, that divine hiddenness has to be understood in terms of the divine pedagogy, of God respecting the fact that we are persons, and of God practicing a certain reserve toward us that honors us as persons. So Guardini would say, yes, there is. Our God is Deus absconditus, a hidden God. But he has not withdrawn from us or abandoned us to ourselves. We should think of him as exercising great power over us that takes the form of empowering us to come to ourselves. Uh, Guardini, in uh, one uh, place, even speaks, trying to capture uh, this mysterious reserve uh, that is there in God's power towards us as persons. Um, he, he says, quite surprisingly, he says, we have to say the act in which God creates human beings is an act of divine reverence. One usually thinks of reverence as something we show God. But Guardini wants to say, no, there's a, a reverence God shows us as persons. And then he cites here a, an expression from Dante. Uh, Dante would have said, Guardini, uh, that God creates human beings 
in an act of cortesia divina, a kind of divine courtesy, uh, an attempt to express this, uh, this reserve, which is not a turning away, but of honoring the other as person. The cortesia divina of God uh, towards us human persons. Uh, that recapitulates a profound theme in Guardini. So that's the second of the themes. I don't know how I'm probably exceeding my time. Where's the timekeeper? Carry on. <laughs> uh, well, uh, the. You have authority over your son. Yes, yeah, well, uh, it's high time that that uh, <laughs> took place. No. Uh, that, uh, uh, we're almost at the end, just one third. Um, wonderful personalist insight from uh, Guardini. You know the great personalist work of Martin Buber, I and Thou, really a classic of personalist thought. I commend it to you highly. Well, in the excerpt I chose for you, uh, in the packet of readings, we have uh, we, we, we see Guardini um, making his own uh, this idea of the I-Thou encounter, but also putting his own stamp on it and developing it in a way beyond Buber. Uh, so it's especially there, pages, uh, the page numbering for the packet, 172 to 174, that's the um, so I just want to um, uh, show you uh, how Guardini uh, makes his own and, um, and enriches this I thou uh, idea that comes, uh, that originates there in uh, Martin Buber. So he imagines there two human beings in a conflict situation, such as, he says, fighting over food. Each sees in the other just an obstacle to attaining the food. Neither sees in the other a being in his own right. So each takes the other as object. We have what Buber called an I-it uh, relation. But then Guardini imagines the transition out of this I-it relation to the other, to a real I-thou. And the description is so rich. Even in English translation, Guardini writes a singularly beautiful German that is sometimes almost poetical. Uh, and so it's particularly unfortunate that we're reduced to a translation, but even the translation uh, conveys um, his deep insight into this uh, breakthrough to the I thou encounter with another. And so he says there, I'm on the middle of 172 in the packet, the other becomes my vow only when the simple subject-object relation ceases. The first step toward the vow is that movement which means hands off and clears the space in which the person's capacity of serving as his own purpose can be realized. This is the first exercise of justice and the basis of all love. Personal love begins decisively not with a movement toward the other, but away from him. At the same moment, my own attitude also changes. In the measure in which I release the being, which at first I regarded only as an object, and consider it as a self meeting me from its own center, I permit the other to become my thou, and I pass from the attitude of a using and fighting subject into that of an I. So that idea of holding fast the other, of releasing the other, 
so as to uh, live out of his or her own center before me, and thereby come to evidence as subject, as thou. That, I think, is very convincingly uh, described by uh, Guardini. But he also uh, uh, goes somewhat beyond the whole um, account found in, in Buber uh, when he proceeds to speak of a certain characteristic vulnerability of encountering another as thou, releasing them to be thou before me. He, he writes, if I may just quote a few more sentences, this process involves a risk when confronting an object, a man is only objectively interested, his personality is at rest, his interior countenance is not revealed, his hands are free for any desired movement. It is only what he possesses and can do that is involved, not his own self, but, but as soon as he confronts the thou, as an I, something arises in him. He loses the protection that consists in the objective quality of the situation in which he is acting. When I glance at another as I, I become open and show myself and enter into, he means, a certain vulnerability. And then he goes on to say how that vulnerability shows itself in the need for some return of the gesture. I, some, I expose myself in taking the other as thou in such a way that I need now by the other to be taken as thou. And that exposure is part of this uh, vulnerability. Uh, and he then proceeds to uh, contrast the, uh, the, as he calls it, the armored self of the I, it, uh, with this vulnerable self of the I, thou. Uh, and he wants to say that vulnerable self is much more alive as person. Uh, the person is shut up and hidden in the armored condition. But I um, encounter the other as person and want to be encountered by him uh, as person just through that setting aside of the armor and the masks and the uh, vulnerable encounter in the I thou relation. So um, that, um, uh, that, 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 that's. Uh, you know, I think it, it's a good specimen, uh, this thought of uh, Guardini on the idea of, 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 the, of the new world that opens with subjectivity. Uh, I don't think in the ancient world you ever have anyone distinguishing between the armored condition of the self vis-a-vis -vis the more vulnerable. But a tremendous truth about the person shows itself in that distinction. And, and, and shows us the, the personalist fruitfulness of the exploration of subjectivity and, in this case, intersubjectivity.